So as I said, presenting our uh, keynote is quite, uh, well, it can be considered a very easy task because most of us know his work. So uh, I'm introducing someone who uh, you have already read. On the other hand, it's quite difficult because uh, it's not really fair to summarize uh, his work in just uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, but I will just try to um, do a brief presentation um, and reminding everyone uh, that Professor John Durham Peters is the Maria Rosa Monacal Professor of English and of Film and Media Studies at Yale University. He received his PhD in Communication Theory and Research from Stanford, and then he joined the University of Iowa, where he taught uh, until 2016. His research has focused on uh, media history and philosophy of communication, and his works have been tremendously influential in media and communication studies, but also in many other fields within the humanities and social sciences. Not only is his work profoundly interdisciplinary, but he has actually advocated the need for scholars particularly those in communication studies to cross borders and uh, engage in interdisciplinary uh, discussions. In uh, his first book, Speaking into the Air, A History of the Idea of Communication, published in 1999, he describes communication as a project of reconciling self and other, while calling attention to the fact that uh, the mistake is that it, the mistake is to think that communications and technologies will solve the problem of communication. Another of his renowned books, Courting the Abyss, Free Speech and the Liberal Tradition, was published in 2005, in which he updates the philosophy of free expression. More recently, in 2015, he wrote The Marvelous Clouds Towards a Philosophy of Elemental Media, and in 2020, he co-authored with late Kenneth Camille, Promiscuous Knowledge, Information, Image, and Other Truth Games in History. During his career, Professor Durham Peters has also published many uh, articles, delivered lectures uh, and keynotes all over the world, and has held fellowships with the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Fulbright Foundation, and also the Leverham Trust. It is therefore a great honor and a great pleasure to uh, pass the floor to uh, John Durham Peters for his keynote entitled Case Studies in the Mediation of the Weather. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a thrill to be here with you. I'm not exactly sure where the here is. Um, this is a very strange thing to be speaking in, into my laptop in New Haven and to see many of your faces and to see many names. Um, um, this morning at 4.30, a smoke alarm went off in my house. It had a, a defective battery. And so um, I woke up and could not go back to sleep. And instead, I woke up with this strange thought um, about Zoom. And if I can do screen share, let's see if I can do this. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Can, can you see my... Um, random French words that showed up. So basically, these are the words that woke up, um, that woke up with me um, this morning. I was thinking about Zoom, and I was thinking about the relation between media and environments. And this relationship is very old. It's a relationship which we see in language itself because the term milieu, which we think of as an environmental word referring to surroundings or periejon is the word that Aristotle used, that which you know, wraps around us, and umbelt comes from the Latin medius locus, or the place in the middle. And so the word medium is already implied in the word milieu. And then I started thinking about how Zoom is actually a milieu, a thousand places, I guess we're only 60. And it's also a milieu, a half place, because one of the weird things about Zoom is that we're, we're all in close-up, or medium close-up. And everything that happens in human interaction from the shoulders down vanishes. And this is kind of strange because you know how important shoes are, for example. 
I'm not going to tell you if I'm wearing shoes or not. I hope um, many of you may not be wearing shoes. And it's sort of bizarre to be in a professional situation in which one might or might not be wearing shoes. Again, I don't uh, disclose this. So I've long been interested in, in the relationship between media and environments. Now to talk about media ecology is almost a cliche in media studies. Such thinking goes back to the great Canadian uh, political um, economic historian, Harold Innes, um, in which to think about environments such as fur or fish or timber was already to be thinking about media. And are also obviously with Marshall McLuhan, if I can do my screen share. Yes, okay. Um, with um, McLuhan, the idea that the medium is an environment is obviously one of the central ideas which he, which he led with. Now, one of the things I've tried to argue, um, inspired by such figures, is that we can also see environments as media. And it, um, the immediate objection to this kind of argument is to say that media are symbolic. Media are intentional, they're human, they're semiotic, they're informational. Um, of course, natural environments, whatever nature means, are highly informative in, in all kinds of ways. But one of the moves which McLuhan makes is to say that a medium need not have information in a strict human sense, and that the light bulb, for example, is his example of a, of a perfect example of a medium because it's a basic infrastructure, which enables other kinds of events to go on. So, you know, the medium of the light bulb, he said, had pure information by which he sort of suggested might not have um, any information at all or might have, have all um, information. Now with, um, so this, this way of thinking about medium and environment is obviously deeply relevant to us um, in a moment in which the ability of people of color to breathe is monitored by citizen uh, video or the tracking of the coronavirus worldwide is done by, by digital means. And that, um, you know, the daily updates in the weather are obviously digitally mediated and everything about our environment in some ways is mediated uh, by media. So it becomes very interesting when we come up upon part of our environment, which is a blind spot, which is a blank which is something which we are not supposed to talk about, which is often not considered dignified enough for intellectual um, discussion. For, for, for Innes, you know, you always had to look out for the blind spot. And so for media scholars, we get really interested when we hear a kind of conspiracy of silence around an object. And that object I wanna suggest is the weather. And it's very bizarre the way that we talk about the weather and the way, ways that we don't talk about the weather. And I promise not to read very much, but if I can just read the, the basic argument, I'm in the middle of a book about this and I've got thousands and thousands of words which I won't um, afflict you with, but I'm just gonna give you um, the basic argument here. Um, there, actually we can see you know, the idea that if you don't have anything to talk about, you can always talk about the weather. So in the beginning, there was weather, but there was no weather report. That came much later. Ordinary weather is a modern invention. This is not to say that weather has not been happening for the billions of years that the Earth has had an atmosphere. As an increasingly rich archive of evidence shows, our planet has had a long and turbulent atmospheric history. My point is that the conception of weather as the purely physical condition of the atmosphere understood on a daily basis was a long time coming. It is not the kind of thing that would have made sense to the authors of Genesis and the Odyssey, to Lucretius or Jesus of Nazareth, or even to Chaucer or Shakespeare or Camões, since we're um, in a uh, a Portuguese a speaking environment. These people knew the sky and its many moods better than most of us ever will, but they knew the sky as, a, as metaphysical drama or the fundamental flow of matter unorganized. 
as primal cosmic fizz, as the avenging punishment of an outraged God, the random swerving of atoms, as a sign in the sky, the sweet showers of April, or a violent storm on the heath. The weather of a single day could, of course, be richly observed and felt throughout history, but it died on the spot. It wasn't really anything. It was just the day. It wasn't weather yet. The ancient Babylonian sky watchers only recorded bad weather. As an ancient historian reports, quote, if it is clear and warm and dry and calm, there is no weather report. The historical emergence of ordinary weather heralds a subtle ontological shift. It signals something new in the cultural history of humankind. Before modern times, ordinary weather was at best vanity of vanities, a puff of smoke, the merest circulation without purpose. It really wasn't, as we say today, um, a thing. Now, where did we get the idea that weather isn't interesting? I mean, really, what could be more dramatic? How did we ever convince ourselves that weather was banal and boring? At best, a starter topic and a social lubricant when you have nothing to say. Where did we get the idea that the sky is without meaning or that the atmosphere has no history? Isn't such alienation from our natural environment deeply telling and deeply troubling? What is the story of the shift? The mystery to me is how something so rich came to be declared so empty and dull. Now, weather, of course, is not a single thing. It is what we feel when we step outside. It is the state of the atmosphere and humidity, temperature, and barometric pressure. It is the filler we use in talk and novels. It is the data that comes in reports. It is a mood, a sound, an influence, a hint of a disposition, the flux of time itself. Maybe it's a stimmung, as we heard from the uh, previous, previous session. It is an act of God. It is a source of boredom or a poetic inspiration. It is a metaphysical abyss. It is a series of pictures. And today, in, in the rest of what I talk about, I'll be focusing particularly on pictures of weather and of climate. And the basic argument, well, you'll see the, uh, the uh, basic argument, but let me introduce the argument via someone else who made my argument for me. Oh, look at this. The zoom chops it off, I'm sorry. But this is Valta Benjamin, who in his uh, Passagenbach, or the Arcades Project on uh, 19th century Paris, had some really brilliant things to say about weather. Um, and here's, here's a quote, I'll quote it in English, but you can read the German here if you prefer. Nothing is more telling than that precisely this most intimate and mysterious affair, the working of the weather on humans, should have become the theme of their emptiest chatter the canvas of their emptiest chatter, we can say. Nothing bores the ordinary man more than the cosmos. Hence for him, the deepest connection between weather and boredom. Now, um, this is when uh, Benjamin is talking about the 1840s. And um, of course, uh, Baudelaire, Charles Baudelaire, the great symbolist poet, is his uh, Virgil to the Selva Oscura of the 19th century. and and. Benjamin sees in, in Baudelaire a new attitude toward weather, that is, the ability to make boring weather into a poetic object. Now, obviously, exciting weather has been a poetic object forever. Um, I mean, and the history of literature from, again, from Genesis in the Bible up to, say, the wasteland or to Ben Lerner's 1004 or to um, Jenny Offal's uh, Weather, to just stick to two recent Brooklyn novels. Um, I mean, spectacular weather is something which is certainly storyable. But Benjamin, in, I think, lit on something very important about modernity. And indeed, that modernity, as the term is coined by Baudelaire, is defined rather meteor meteorologically. It's a difficult word to say but as, as the fugitive, the contingent, the, uh, the transitory. You know, we don't often notice how often our words for history are actually weather words, Aufklärung, 
or the enlightenment is obviously a weather term, the clearing up. Um, modernity is a weather term. The Cold War is um, um, a kind of a weather term. Um, so, so Benjamin's comments about weather are connected with his thinking about time. And um, this contrast, which is so important for him between uh, empty and homogeneous time, ordinary time, one thing after another time, serial time, daily time, mundane, quotidian time, versus messianic time, time all at once. And to me, it's quite fascinating that um, the word for weather, you'll know this, is the word for time in most um, Southern European languages. O tempo, I assume in, in, in Portuguese, um, tiempo in Spanish, le temps um, in French, and most interesting to me in Greek, um, modern Greek, kieros is the word for, for weather. And I mean, you can see I just lifted this from a, from a Greek weather report. It says the weather now, o kieros tora. Um, you know, in ancient Greek, kairos meant something similar but different. It meant opportunity, um, good timing, the, the occasion. I mean, it could even mean the right spot to kill your enemy. The right spot to kill your enemy is the temple. Why do we call it the temple? The temporal lobe, temporal time, because it has to do with kairos, good timing, the right place to, uh, uh, to uh, hit. So you can see, if you look at the bottom of this image, um, you know, the, the, the bottom middle, it says the weather in Europe. Um, bottom right says the weather in the world. And if you didn't know modern Greek, you might think this was some kind of lofty rhetorical or theological term. You know, the, the kairos of the cosmos, but it actually means the weather in the world. Um, how is it that a word for opportunity, um, of course, this has a long theological history, became um, a word for weather? In other words, the semantic history of this word itself traces the kind of dialectic that Benjamin is interested in between everyday, um, everyday time, quotidian time, and messianic time. And obviously weather is a classic domain for this kind of dialectic because so much of our weather is boring and one thing after the other, but some of it is extreme and terrifying and um, spectacular. Okay, so, and Benjamin was very interested in 19th century Paris. I didn't find him actually writing about this um, quite amazing painting. Um, this is a painting which uh, Franco Moretti, among others, has, has uh, talked about. And it's remarkable that um, Moretti, the great theorist of, of the novel, and a filler, doesn't talk about weather, which is obviously one of the great ways that moderns have found to fill their time and that the 19th century novel itself is full of weather. This image is particularly interesting to me because you have these bourgeois ladies and gentlemen who are actively disinterested in weather. Can you hear the leaf blowers in the background speaking of, of weather? I don't know if, if you can. There's always the risk of environmental intrusion when you talk about weather. Um, Anyway, the ladies and gentlemen are, are completely indifferent to weather, whereas the painter is totally fascinated by the shifting flux of this newly uh, renovated Paris. You know, this painting is also a kind of eloge of the newly Osmanized, the Osmanize, the Haussmanized city, when it's remodeled so that the, the rain doesn't collect in muddy gutters, it shines on the uh, street. But the, this is a kind of good example of the kind of 19th century weather dialectic that I think um, Benjamin is, is talking about. These, these bourgeois who are brandishing an umbrella against anything that would threaten their self-regard. I mean, can almost, you know, they're kind of protruding their interiority, their private privilege in the public sphere. Whereas in the background, in the far left, you see people exposed like a guilty conscience to the, um, um, to the to the weather itself. So, 19th century weather 
it's a cliche that the worst opening in, in the English novel, it was a dark and stormy night, which is actually a, a real opening of, of a novel, Paul Clifford by Bulwer Lytton, which I think Snoopy in Charles Schultz's um, um, Peanuts uh, made famous. And of course, that isn't only the, the opening sentence. Um, Bulwer Lytton goes on about violent gusts of wind and scanty flames of lamps struggling against the darkness. And of course, this kind of um, weather talk is a fixture in 19th century novels. Um, Mark Twain, in fact, made fun of it in, in a, a one of his late novels in which he, dis, he claimed to write a novel completely without weather. But since he was afraid he might uh, deprive his, uh, his listeners, his readers, he provided a four-page appendix of weather events that people could turn to um, at the end. Um, or um, Another example is in The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde, also very much an indoor comedy of manners. It's interesting that weather becomes something talked about when it's, when it's indoors. Gwendolyn says, please don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. And in fact, Jack, Mr. Worthing, is, doesn't care about the weather, he cares about her. The weather is a, a pretext for talking about something else. So, you know, um, in Marxist language, we would use the term alienation to talk about um, um, weather and the moderns. In Freudian language, psychoanalytic language, we would talk about um, a repression. And, you know, it, as we know, in Marxist thought, um, ideology always leaves its mark and repression always uh, always returns and it's pretty clear that um, weather has has come back in all kinds of uh, remarkable ways um, this is a famous example some of you will know the um, the Deutsche Bahn the German Railways slogan from the 1970s which gave rise to like a meme a political meme in Germany when lots of different parties um, would, uh, would mimic this, but everybody talks about the weather, we don't, as if to kind of brag that, you know, we're, we're just gonna get down to business. Just the facts, man. You know, we're, we're not gonna mess around. Um, the weather doesn't bother us. We are too cool to be bothered by weather because we always, yeah, trains run on time. Um, so there's a backlash. Obviously, there's, there's a kind of backlash um, against um, talking about weather. Um, and I think at our moment, there's a growing nervousness about talking about the weather no longer as, as the common realm or, or, the, or the safe topic which strangers can talk about. Um, indeed, the first um, evidence I can find of people talking ab um, about talking about the weather, not talking about the weather, people have talked about the weather forever. Sailors, farmers, I mean, travelers, people planning weddings, astrologers, priests, prophets, I mean, you name it, poets have been talking about the weather forever. But only in the 18th century that I can tell did talking about the weather become a speech genre, a, a, a polite mode of, uh, of discussion. And, and obviously, you know, um, by now we're starting to see a general backlash. Um, against that. Sorry, we'll have to, I should have realized, speaking of affordance as a good ecological term and setting up um, Zoom that um, it, it would, some of the words would be blocked. But I think one of the greatest weather theorists ever is Virginia Woolf, um, who just has a remarkable sensitivity to weather and a remarkable sensitivity to periodization. And Orlando, which is, such a hilarious novel, and more typically read as, as the, you know, thinking about gender, gender blending, gender crossing. Um, it's also about weather, because weather has that weird kind of gender ambiguity. Um, you know, traditionally called she, of course. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's often, weather's often feminized, but it's often, um, anyway, let's just stick with, with uh, Virginia Woolf, who's much better than the me on this. 
everything was different for the Elizabethans. The weather itself, the hot and cold of summer and winter, was, we may believe, of another temper altogether. The brilliant amorous day was divided as surely from the night as land from water. Sunsets were redder and more intense. Dawns were more, oh, I, I can't, sorry, whatever that is, bright, whatever she said, and more auroral. Of our crepuscular half-lights and lingering twilights, they knew nothing. The rain fell vehemently or not at all. The sun blazed or all was darkness. Of course she's being um, tongue-in-cheek, although there may be decent reasons to think that the Elizabethans had, had, the, had a colder climate uh, because of the Little Ice Age. Um, but she's also talking about what gets written. That is, ordinary weather is not a matter of record. If we want ordinary record, typically humans didn't, I mean, if we want records of ordinary weather, typically human authors, poets, painters did not portray it. We have to go to proxies. We have to go to lake bed sediments. We have to go to ice core samples. We have to go to tree rings. Uh, because nature seems much more interested in boring weather, in banal weather, than humans have been, at least recently. Now, of course, an interest in dramatic weather is very, as long standing. This is a medieval uh, depiction of Moses sending the uh, plague upon Egypt, the plague of flies um, in, uh, um, in particular. And, you know, dramatic weather narratives have legs. So, I mean, if there's a dramatic weather story, it's, it's typically lasted over the years, such as this story. I mean, this has been one of the most flexible stories that has ever been invented. Um, Eco-critical thinkers talk about arcs as ways of species uh, preservation. Biblical fundamentalists build theme parks in which they build the arc uh, to scale. Um, you know, movie makers make uh, not very good movies like this one. Um, pardon my opinion. I mean, it's part video game. Um, Aronofsky gets a little bit confused with Abraham and Noah. Anyway, let's, let's not go there. What I'm interested in is the way that this story persists, the dramatic weather persists um, in a way that banal weather was never written. Um, another example, Jesus calming the storm, an amazing, amazing image by, by Rembrandt, his only seascape. Um, it's in medias race. You can see the ship is about to fall back into the trough. And if you look carefully, I think it's probably hard to see the lowermost figure in red is pitching something across the side on um, probably his breakfast or his dinner, since this is um, a nighttime scene. Note also that the figure in green, who's Rembrandt, looks just like Rembrandt there. So little jokes, little Easter eggs um, in here. But, you know, Dramatic weather narrative lives on, you know, a medieval woodcut of heavenly prod prodigies. So, you know, Gauche famously, um, among many other theorists of the novel, points out how the novel has been designed, um, this is his argument, to be the habitual, the banal, the regular, the, uh, the uniformitarian. You know, his thesis, of course, has trouble. Many people have pointed out that if you miss if you exclude science fiction, then maybe it works, but there are all kinds of examples of large scale thinking about drastic, drastic change in, um, in a novel form. But it's, it's remarkable, I mean, Gauche obviously is thinking about climate, but the people that he builds on, such as uh, Moretti, I mean, as I already pointed out, doesn't think explicitly about weather. And even more remarkably to me, um, Auerbach in a, Mimesis, just you know, for me, like the greatest book of literary uh, criticism in the 20th century, doesn't talk about weather, and yet he, weather is all over that book. And um, in Flaubert, Madame Bovary is basically a kind of weather report. She's a compilation of very insig insignificant items stirred together in one. The way that he, the Auerbach talks about Madame Bovary is very much the way that other people in the 1850s 
the same time as the novel are talking about um, the weather report. There's a little weather in uh, Mimesis, I have to give him credit when he talks about uh, Virginia Woolf, of course, um, to the lighthouse. Okay, so if I can give you my, my argument in three two by two tables, that this is gonna be really, really kind of, um, what's the word, abbreviated. Um, but I mean, one of the remarkable things is that if, if once upon a time, and by tradition, I know tradition modernity is not a very good um, distinction for talking about the very complex periodization of human history, but if we just give, give it to me for the sake of things, for a lot of the history of the world, it was climate that was dull and relatively predictable. I'm not saying there weren't droughts, I, I'm not saying there weren't variation, but you could sort of count on knee high by the 4th of July, which is what they say in Iowa about the corn. Um, you could basically count on certain kinds of recurrent patterns. One swallow doesn't make a spring, says Aristotle. You know, the ancient Greeks knew a lot about swallows, and they knew that one is not a very reliable indicator. What's remarkable is that in modernity, the thing that terrifies us is not the weather, as it was in antiquity, it's the climate and its climate models, which are the really scary things. Whereas the weather report, and again, I'm not saying we don't have extreme weather, but the, the weather report, what could be as dull and predictable and quotidian as the thing you pull up on your phone, which is gonna tell you what the weather is now, what it, what it was yesterday. So there's this uh, remarkable shift in, um, you know, what counts as, as terrifying to us. If you just let me, um, mention something here. In the IPCC report of 2018, there's a really fascinating discussion, if I can find it, of the difference between um, annual average temperature rising by 1.5 degrees Celsius versus 2 degrees Celsius um, by the year 2100. And as, as you all know, half a degree of annual rise would be hugely significant. For example, basically all the coral reefs would be destroyed um, if it's a two degree rise rather, rather than a 1.5 degree rise. Um, there's a chance that they won't be. Um, I mean, half, half of a degree is enough to spell utter cataclysm. Whereas half a degree, we can't even feel that. At the beach, the sand is 60 degrees Celsius. If you stand up, the air on your shoulders is 40 degrees Celsius and the breeze around your face is 30 degrees. So I mean, you stand up and you span in one second 30 degrees Celsius, whereas half a degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius, however you want to think about it, is, is something which, is, um, which makes the difference between a habitable planet and one which is totally catastrophic. So I mean, you can see that basically all three of these tables make, um, make that uh, same point. So this is an obvious problem of trying to communicate the urgency of climate change. If we're dealing in such obscurely small increments that we can surpass them by standing up to a f by a factor of, of 30, I shouldn't say a factor of 30, but by 30 times, um, how do we actually uh, communicate that. And so the rest of my talk, I'm going to argue that we do it, one way that we can do it is by pictures. And that there's a long tradition of actually thinking about climate sensuously in pictures. And of course, this like uh, Professor Saucy will be a defense of the, of the humanities and its relevance. Oh yeah, speaking of, of, of pictures, you know, th the point here is simply that maybe talking about the weather is no longer a safe topic. Maybe you're talking to your denialist neighbor who thinks that climate change, yeah, I know I'm mostly talking to people who live in Europe, and so maybe you have less crazy people over there. Whenever I talk to Europeans, I feel like I should apologize for my country. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's a crazy place, a wonderful place. It's a crazy place. Um, so here's a picture that I took one morning in Iowa. I looked up and I thought, Yes, the gods want to play tic-tac-toe. I thought, no, 
the government is doing a chemtrail conspiracy. And I thought, no, the pilots are bored. And then I thought, no, I live in a flyover state, um, which means that no one wants to land in Iowa. People are flying over to go somewhere else. And in fact, where I live now in Connecticut, you cannot get a pattern in the sky like this. Um, so the sky actually tells us a lot about our, our condition, even though we moderns have been training ourselves to think that the sky is empty, which is nuts. It's totally nuts to think that the sky is empty and blank and the wild, wild blue yonder when the sky is militarized. It's this place of Star Wars and satellites and, and, and carbon and chemistry and radio waves. I mean, the sky and chemtrails, obviously. Um, you know, the sky is the place that's been more radically altered than anyone else by modernity. You can see uh, my computer doing its little environmental thing here. Um, so are we, the yes, sky. You know, why does this happen? I mean, it's interesting if you look at the origins of a perspective, Renaissance perspective, Brunelleschi um, in the 15th century said, I'm not going to try to draw the sky. I'm going to draw the earth, but I'm going to have a mirror that's going to draw the sky. In this, the first photograph, by some arguments, Daguerre's Boulevard du Temple in Paris, the sky, to me, is this is fascinating. The sky is washed out. It almost looks like a nuclear bomb went off or something. You know, the, the sky is empty and washed out because the, because the luminance, the brightness of the sky is so different from the ground. And the sky is moving. It's mobile. So there's something strange about, about the sky's resistance to um, medial registration in the same way that climate is resistant to our experiential knowledge. I mean, you can't get splashed or muddied by climate. An umbrella will help you against weather. An umbrella is, an umbrella is not going to help you against climate. Here, in a similar sort of way, you know, the sky is getting washed out. This, uh, this famous image is a, is a composite, you know, because in 19th century photography, if you wanted to have both a landscape and a skyscape, you would often have to do composite photography. Uh, Le Clay, actually, the, these are separate images um, uh, superimposed on each other. Speaking of Baudelaire, by the way, he has, a, he has one of his prose poems about this image. Um, Richter. It's an amazing, an amazing image. I just put it in here because it's, it's beautiful. Um, obviously, the, the sea is inverted as a sky here. If you flip it over, you can see that it's actually the seascape is a skyscape. All right, so a medieval almanac. This, this image is interesting for a lot of reasons to me. Um, the main reason that I'm going I'm to focus on is that it's a composite. It's a temporal composite. This is an image of February. It's not an image of a particular day in February. It's an image of what always happens in February. Now, I used to think that still images only capture a moment in time, a single moment. But I was deluded. Single images can capture spans of time, lots of time at once. This is a climate image, I would suggest, not a weather picture. It's chronos. It's not kairos. It's not keros. I mean, I mean, even though, it, I mean, there isn't a place in February in France that you can actually see this image in which the crows are doing their things, the sheep, the bees, the lady of the house is warming herself. The, the less civilized people are warming themselves and exposing themselves. I don't know if you can see that they're actually exposing themselves, um, but they are. You know, the gentleman out there is practicing his golf swing, it looks like. Not really, he's, he's gathering wood. I mean, it's, it's an amazingly composed, composite image. It's a climate image. Um, and so if we want to think about ways we can represent, you know, lots of things happening at once, which is what we need in a climate model, computerized climate model depend upon massive amounts of data, we can recognize that that European art, for example, has been doing this for a long time. Um, here's, here's another example. This image of um, 
by Bruegel of the census at Bethlehem, the folks telling, um, is right at the beginning of the Grindelwald fluctuation, a cold spell of the Little Ice Age. Um, so it's a wintry landscape, obviously. It's political. Um, you can see that the Habsburg crest is shown here, standing in for the Romans. So the Roman overlords or the Habsburg overlords. Um, a little joke. What's most interesting to me about this, this image is what is exactly in the middle of it? If you look exactly in the middle of this image, what do you see? You see a wheel. You actually see two wheels. One's on a broken cart. One is just sort of sitting there in the middle of nowhere. But what's that wheel doing there? I just think it's an interpretive guide to your eye. That wheel is saying, this is a centripetal picture. You don't have enough eyes to see everything at once. You run out of eyes looking at this picture. You need to look at a lot of things, one thing after the other. You know, if you think of Benjamin's, you know, empty time in order to get to messianic time, in order to get the time of the all at once, the climate time, the time of the now, the yet sight, you need to let your eye rove um, everywhere. And there's so many interesting things um, about this image that, that I won't dwell on, but it's, um, I mean, it's remarkable in the way that the, the banal and the magical, the holy are happening at the same time, because there's, there's the Virgin Mary about do I give birth in a barn? So I mean, you know, the great turning point in history, you can see that Bruchel has the sunset. If you look at the tall tree, you can see on the horizon a little red um, blob, which is the uh, sunset. So he's, you know, he's talking about a shift, uh, a big historical shift happening in a very inconspicuous way, a kind of weather-like way. Okay, this image is a, a, re a real stunner. 400 years old. We can look back 400 years in time. If you're ever, if, if any of you are in Stockholm, I'm not sure exactly where everybody is, go over, over to the National Museum and look at this. It's, it's by another Dutch artist. It's a still life. Um, what's remarkable about this image is that it's com completely impossible. This is an impossible image of cut flowers in 1620. Um, if you were to run a kind of time stamp on this image, what you would get is a blur from April to August. Because tulips tend to blossom in April, whereas you have cyclamen, which are in August. Rose are, roses are uh, repeat bloomers. They're caterpillars, which tend to show up in late summer. What uh, Boschart is doing here is he's doing a sampler across time. This is a compilation, it's a climate compilation, an imaginary world of what it would be like to have an all at once of, of these flowers. It's a kind of vertical montage, as, um, as Eisenstein, Sergei Eisenstein would say, say later. Not a montage that moves you know, one image from the other, but it, there's several images like laminate superimposed um, on this picture of different seasons um, coming into being. So it's a kind of seasonal um, complication. Compilation, I'm sorry, it's also a compli complication. All right, so the next three pictures, three of the greatest landscape painters ever, uh, Rastal, the uh, 17th century great uh, landscape artist, John Constable and uh, William Turner, British uh, uh, landscape painters. What's interesting to me about these three painters is that each one has found their pet meteorologist. And what I mean by this is that there are meteorologists who are completely fascinated by the way that weather is represented by these three artists. So um, Ossing, um, a German meteorologist in, um, in Potsdam, has written a lot about Rastal and, and says that actually you can see the Little Ice Age on canvas. And that, that what Rastal is doing here is a sort of picture of weather. Now, of course, I mean, Ossing is very sophisticated about this. He's not saying it's a photograph, but he's saying that Rastal, through repeated knowledge of 
uh, uh, repeated observation of weather is able to, to uh, represent um, wind shear, there's my warning, so I, um, to represent wind shear um, and even, even the crows flying. Constable himself was fascinated by weather and wanted to represent it on his canvas, sometimes letting raindrops mix with these spontaneous images so that the weather would become consubstantial with the, uh, uh, with the image, image itself. His meteorologist is um, a British meteorologist named John Thorns, who's a fantastic book about Constable as a kind of meteorologist and, and the dependability of his paintings, such that Thorns can actually date some of his paintings based on other weather records of the moment to show when Constable must have painted it. Most wildly, um, a recent Greek team of atmospheric chemists has studied um, 19th century British landscape painting, especially Turner. And you can show by looking at this obviously just a, um, a Google, um, Google images search for um, Turner sunsets. But Zerebos, the, um, you know, the leader of the, you know, the atmospheric chemist who led the study shows that um, Turner's sunsets are actually a reliable signal of volcanic activity in the 19th century. And that you can actually see, um, you know, Tambor is the most famous um, eruption from, from 1816, but that you can actually see volcanic activity represented if you compare Turner like with ice core samples uh, from Greenland or with lots of other evidence of, um, of climate and of, of atmospheric composition. So th this is kind of, um, kind of wild to me that um, paintings of all things in which we think that the artist has this uh, wild liberty to paint as they want would actually have an index of truth as to um, climate history. And it's remarkable to me that it's the scientists, it's the meteorologists who may have figured this out um, because I fear that we humanists are sometimes too stuck sometimes in the two cultures and too afraid to think that what we have to say is truth. I think humanities are about truth. Truth, really seriously. It's not just about sensibility. It's not just about interpretation. We've got to hang on to the claim that we have stuff to say about the universe, about the climate, about justice. If we give that up, we are really lost. I'm going to skip some of these more, um, more data images and just um, this image is, is, is way too famous, but still important to think about the uh, blue marble. And what's remarkable here is that if you compare it like with Humboldt's great image of isotherms in the 19th century, this is also a global image. And we don't have time to talk about it, but it's abstract. You'd really need to puzzle it out. This is a representation of the North Atlantic Gulf Stream warming, it, the, the way that it sort of Curve, curve like this. It's abstract and it's, it's a composite based upon the reports of many. But when we get to the blue marble, you actually have an earth view which is phenomenologically possible for a single embodied observer. And this is also a kind of warping, I think, I mean, a, a kind of ontological shift in the way that we are confronted to think about weather. Because if we can actually see, a single body can see planetary weather. This is um, a truly remarkable shift. So just to go back, I mean, these are basically what I would say characteristic images. 17th century, Halley's uh, perhaps first weather map, a remarkable thing, a map of variables rather than constants. Ben Franklin's almanac, in which his weather predictions are all over the place, whereas his um, his astronomical predictions are down to the hour. Um, Humboldt's um, isotherm, the blue marble. And I, th I think for the 21st century, our characteristic image for representing climate would be the Keeling curve. Um, this image is slightly out of date. Th this is um, um, a more recent one. If you look at March of 2020, you can see there's a little dip I think many of us were looking for the silver lining of, of the pandemic. 
besides having a lot of people like me in desperate need of haircuts. Um, we were hoping that the Keeling curve was going to flatten out. And, and, and look at March. I mean, March is actually dipping down, but nope. Sad news, it seems to be zipping up as ever. So, yeah, we can um, think about tyranny and weather. Xerxes whipped, whipped the ocean because it wouldn't behave. King Lear raged against the storm. Well, there's another tyrant who was very upset that he was wrong about the weather. So he personally drew a Sharpie marker to show that it indeed Hurricane Dorian would hit um, Alabama. And I mean, it's very clear from, no one's actually said it, but it's very clear that it was um, Mr. Trump who actually drew, you know, altered the uh, weather map. So who says weather is not about power? Um, I mean, indeed, weather is ideology because weather shows us climate. It doesn't show us poverty. It doesn't show us, um, you know, nuclear waste facilities. I'm almost done, I promise. Yeah, so other sharply, Trump sharpie efforts, Greenland, um, sorry. Um, so here's, here's the image that I want to conclude with. Some of you may have, uh, I mean, I'm sure all of you heard about this. I'm not even sure it's an image though. Um, it might be a data file. There was, there's so much data in this thing, this black hole, um, that it had to be shipped, the hard drives had to be shipped because internet wasn't strong enough to actually carry all the data. The way that this image was created was to turn the earth into a lens, was to make a kind of planetary telescope of observatories which compiled um, um, many different points of view so that it, you had the biggest lens, lens possible. It's also fascinating to me that this is an image of photons disappearing because what black holes do is they eat photons. And that's what cameras do. Cameras eat photons. So cameras and black holes are sort of rivals in efforts to depict something which is necessary is something which is impossible. And I think if there's an allegory for our moment, this is a good image for us to be thinking about because it's the place where matter goes to die. It's the place where light goes to die, a black hole, but it's also a place in which human ingenuity has figured out an earth scale um, technology to represent the place where black holes I mean, where light goes to die. So where the danger is, there is the saving power, as Hölderlin famously wrote. So if I can sort of end on a, on a slightly hopeful note, I really do believe that the humanities, that pictures, that stories, that poems, that words, have the ability that technologies of picture taking can teach us something about our plight as beings on a fragile planet in a cosmos that needs all the love we can give it. And that's it. Thank you very much.